We can, okay, I'm running right now, and uh, it's running for number two right now. It is? Okay, so I'll very quickly tell the story. So I was in class, and I wasn't crying. I was kind of in shock. I had just come from New York and back to class again. And we were on stage doing an exercise, and a relaxation exercise, and all of a sudden, out of the clear blue sky, I wasn't crying or anything. Lee said, what's wrong, Karen? Come down here. So I came off stage. I didn't know why he, what he, why he would have called me down. I was just doing my work. And he said, sit here. He didn't look at me. And he's still directing, relax, relax, move your arm to the people on the stage. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden he just took my hand without looking at me and he said, something's wrong, what's wrong? And I said, my fiancé just dropped dead in New York. And he didn't say anything, he just, you know, kept directing and, and he didn't look at me and he said, you know, I lost someone I love too. And then he was quiet, and then all of a sudden the class was over, and he, he got up and he looked at me and he said, Karen, all the feelings you're feeling now, those will be oil colors that you will paint with in your work. Yes. Someday they will be beautiful for you. And he left. And it's true what he said, because Martin Landau talks about that all the time. One thing an actor has with all the pain and things, is a, is a gift, it's gold to the actor. You know, we're the only people who can take really negative, dark things Painful and, turn them, and, and turn them into beauty. Right. The, you know? It's, it's really, it's a gift. It, it's, it, the public wouldn't understand that, but it's, in a sense, it's a gift to the actor. Yes. In, it's a, it, it, the actor, it's his, the only thing, it's what Lee said, they're oil colors, and you paint with them as yes. actors. And, um, I, he made me understand, he made me, what that did was not only as an actor he helped me, but he helped me understand that all the dark things in my life I could survive yeah. because I would be using them someday. Yeah. It helped you as a human being, as a person. Yes. 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 People don't realize that. Yes. I want to talk, we have a few minutes. You just did something for the Armenian community. Yes, I did. And, you, and I know you wanted to. I would love to hear the audience. Okay, I, I am Armenian, um, and on April 24th of this year, 2015, um, was 100 years, that was the horrible genocide that the Turks um, destroyed a million and a half Armenians. And so I was very fortunate at the Kirk Douglas Theater, the, Mark Taper and Center Theater Group put together this wonderful event at the, at the Kirk Douglas. And there were some wonderful Armenian actors. In fact, um, the, the great actress who was nominated for an Academy Award in, um, is it called uh, House, uh, House, House of, uh, Dawn is in the word. She's a, a, an Iranian actress. Oh, she, yes, yes. She, she has this deep voice. Yeah, but that She's so wonderful, yes. Smoked Camels for yes, 50 years. That's, yes, <laughs> Anyway, she was in yes. And the man who was in Borat, the big heavy man, yeah, Ken right. WDN. Yeah. Anyway, it was a wonderful evening, and there were about five, 600 people there. And we did this great pieces, three pieces, the genocide pieces. And afterwards, they had a in, they had a conference. Of four people sat on stage and talked about genocide, and a lot of there were some people in the audience who didn't know yet, really, what had happened between the Armenians and the Turks. And I just want to share with you. I'm sure you know, but I'm going to repeat it since it's just a few days, a week or so after the uh, event, that in 1915. The Armenians and Turks had lived together for years and years. And in, 19, in 1915, the young Turks came in, and they decided that they wanted to take over the land of the Armenians, the monies and the banks of the Armenians, and of course Armenians, I don't know if you know, were the first Christians to accept Christianity as a nation before the Romans. They were the first nation. 
So, of course, the Turks are Muslim. So they wiped out a million and a half Armenians. Mm -hmm. um, horribly. Um, walked them in the deserts, threw babies up and caught, caught them with bayonets. Yes. Um, uh, threw people in rivers, poured gasoline on beautiful dance girls that they made to dance and burned them to death. Um, why I'm bringing all this grotesquerie up is that Hitler studied all the things that the Young Turks did. And he admits that he learned everything that he eventually was capable of from the Turks and how they, they uh, remedied their situation with the Armenians. Um, there are quotes you can find of, of Hitler speaking about it. And my, my point of view is that perhaps if there had not been a Turkish Armenian where they had killed the Armenians, the genocide, there may have not been. Who knows? There may have not been all the, the Jews killed by Hitler because yeah. it gave him an idea. It's an interesting point that you bring up there. I know. I never knew that myself. Yes. So each genocide that we have teach, teaches other bad people. I mean, we have to learn. I, I know why the Turks don't, won't admit it. It's very simple. They, it's, they, they don't want to give back land and monies that they took away from the Armenians. Um, simple as that. It's financial. Otherwise, you know, for a century, for a century now, we've been bothering them to admit it. Right. Well, why wouldn't they just admit it? I mean, it's simple. The Germans did, um, but they won't because they just don't want to deal. Then they'd be liable. Well, it, for the reparation. Yes, the reparation. I mean, the, half of Turkey is was Armenia. Well, a good part of that. No, half of it, Glendale is. <laughs> I know, I know. But anyway, so yes, this is a very important time for the Armenians. And thank God for the Pope who said, you know, there was a genocide. And then, of course, the Turks pulled out of the Vatican and they pulled out of Italy their, um, their ambassadors. Wow. They're so upset we're now with Italy and with the Pope. And well, you're on both sides. You're Italian and Armenian. Yes, but I, am, I have to ask I'm, you on on the Italian side. Do you call it sauce or gravy? Do I call it sauce? Oh, you call it sauce. I right. call it sauce. Oh, we, you call you you're talking about like spaghetti marinara, marinara well, sauce? Well, yeah, we, we call, call it, it gravy sauce. in New York. I, you call it gravy? Oh, gravy. We, I was taught. I have to tell you something. I didn't know I was Armenian until I was mm, about. 11, yeah. because my name was Karen Condon. My grandmother and mother had taken off the IAN, and it's because my grandmother fled the genocide. She was so scared of anyone knowing we were Armenian. Um, I'll tell you a very quick story about my great-grandfather. My great-grandfather used to have dreams that always came true, apparently, and people were scared of his grandpa's dreams. They called him grandpa. Um, he worked for the English Embassy. Um, he was a very smart man, but he, he had these peculiar dreams. And one night, one day, he came home from work to his wife and said, pack up. She said, what? We've been here hundreds of years, our people. Pack up. So she had to. She packed up the children. He had money. They hired a Turk, Turkey, Turkish bandits who put the children on the camels in the, in the bags on the side, and they, they went. They finally arrived in Marseille after many, many uh, days of traveling. And when they got to Marseille, they found out, word was given to them, the city, their city, Bitlis, had been destroyed. So because of my great-grandfather's dream, I'm here, I'm here. And that's the gift we received. Yes, I mean, he had this crazy dream. He took his family, went to America, and here I am. I mean, things are... But where does the Moroccan influence oh, come into you? Um, well, and actually, actually Obama, some of it is Turkish. Turkish. Some of it is Turkish. Okay. Well, the Armenians and Turks are very similar in their food, clothes, language, 
we have a special language. We have Armenian, but the, the Armenians don't have swear words, so they use the Turkish swear words. Um, <laughs> and um, so you can see around this apartment flavors of, um, of uh, Iranian, Turkish, per, you know, Persian. Yes. Um, you can see Chinese. You can see Japanese. I'm sitting on an opium bed. When come around, I'll take. I'll get off of the opium bed, and you can take a picture of the opium. Do you want me to leave it or just? No, it's it's great. I can. Yeah. Can you see the opium bed? Yeah. And, um, and in the other room, it's the same thing. Um, I but just, I mean, that's. I just. We got a nice view, and and I'm thinking to myself, and 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 all well, the folks out there can. That's that's Los Angeles out there, but this beautiful apartment. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's so elegant, and I'm thinking... Well, I've always loved, you know, uh, exotic things. Yeah. And exotic is... Uh, you are, it, I mean, uh, you really are. Taste. And, you know, I fell in love with women in a black slip when I saw the rose tattoo. Yes. Anna Magnani when she... Yes, Anna Magnani. Magnani when... Magnani. <laughs> um, I always that. wanted to play her, you know. She, uh, she was such a... I mean... You could play her today. Well, you know, she passed away, I think, in her, she was in her 50s, I think, late yeah. 50s. Um, you could do her today. She's, she was uh, extraordinary. Um, I Do you know who Anna Magnani is? I'm speaking to the people out there. If you don't, you better look her, look up. her up. Yeah. Look her. She, and also yeah. you did the master class. Yes, I played Maria Callas. Uh, I love that. My two favorite roles, you know, I'm going to ask you what your favorite roles. My two favorite were Rose Tattoo and Master Class, playing Maria Callas. Uh, Simon Levy at the Fountain Theater, again, directed me in that. Really? What are your two favorite roles? Actually, uh, what? that I would like to do with the detective story. You've done it. Yes, but I, would, I love that one. The one I haven't done is Come Back Little Sheba. I like to play oh, Doc. Oh, it's a great role. Oh, we could do that together. Yes, we could. You know, at our age still. Yeah, really. You know? That would be a great we scene. Should, to we do. should do that at the studio. Maybe it's I would love to. It's been, I, always, I, but I'm such a big fan of Lancaster. Oh, I thought he was brilliant in he the was, part. He was a wonderful actor. People didn't know what a fine actor he was. And, you know? and, and he, a lot of his films were done because he did them. He was one of the first successful actor producers. And Kirk Douglas. Kirk Douglas, well, his son more than, but I mean, Burt Lancaster, all his, his production company was really yes, big. Yes, but Kirk Douglas got together with uh, Stanley Kramer. And um, you know they they did stuff together. I don't know yes. if you know yeah, that. Yes. Oh, I know. You but know? He, and he he was an interesting man. He was one of the first people too yeah. who started producing some of his own films. Um, now you got me interested in Doc because oh. I I would love to work with you. I mean, what, well, what so actor let's wouldn't? Let's do it. Let's do it. My God, that would be very interesting. I have this on tape now, so <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> It's like talk about <laughs> not getting out, out of a promise. <laughs> now, you, um, I'm going to end because I know you really have to run. I'm letting you yes, go. Yes, I do. But you're going to a memorial service? Yes. Or do, do you want to say who it is? It or? was Paul Ryan, the man Paul, I spoke to. You spoke about early who, in the first show. Who, who, um, and got, what did got, Paul do? Paul got Tennessee Williams to see Rosette, too. But I mean, was, the, was he a director? Oh, he was, no, he was, a, he was a teacher of comedy. He was a friend. He also ha did this wonderful uh, cable. He was one of the first interviewers on cable. He, in he interviewed everyone from, I think he interviewed Lee, Lee Strasberg, and um, Anthony Hopkins, and you know, many, many extraordinary people. In fact, I'd love to find out you know, where, where all his tapes are. It would be oh, man, amazing uh, to, to, for people to use for you know, to put it on television somewhere. They were, right. There are all these people at a young age. I have a lot of the shows I did with members there at the studio. One of these days i got to get some money together and put them on DVD because they're on the tapes, oh, which yes. is, you know, people don't have tape record. I think it's these. wonderful that you're doing this. Years ago. Well, you're it's sort of collecting, you know, the, the, the actor studio members, you yeah. know, and sometime when they're gone, you know, will this CB is, still be here? And people want to know what the work is about. People don't, when I rehearsed at Actors Studio in New York, 
I would always allow the observers to watch my rehearsals because they don't, the public doesn't see the finish, you know, how we work. They see the finished product. Yes, that's right. So that's why the, my idea for the show was and other things. So we get to know how do actor studio people work and what they're about. Actually, casting directors love this, my show, because they get to know who you are. Oh, that's great. You know, because we know who the characters are. Yes. But they want to know who you are. Oh, well, you know. I'll say one last thing before I leave, talking about, you know, who, who we are. Um, just to inspire people out there, I've acted, obviously, as you can tell, since I was a child. And then about eight years ago, I decided I would write. So... Oh, your book, I apologize. No, it's, it's okay. Yes. I was going to say, I forgot about it, too. But, <laughs> you know, actors, I believe actors are Renaissance people. They can do anything. Um, if they set their mind to it and have the stamina uh, to write a book. It took me six years and 27 drafts, and um, I won't go into why, but it's called The Whip, and I'm very grateful it's won some awards. It's based on the true story of a woman who lived her life as a man in the Old West, and she was one of the first women to, she was the first woman to vote in America as a man for General Grant. Um, she fell in love with a, an African-American runaway slave during the Civil War, actually pre-Civil War. And um, he was hung by the beginnings of the Ku Klux Klan, so she put on men's clothes, left Boston, and came to California to find the killer. And meanwhile, she became a famous stagecoach driver. 30 years she passed as a man. Now here she was with all these macho stagecoach drivers. You know, they, excuse me, peed together and they yes. ate together and everything. And you know, how she carried it off, I have no idea. Um, then when they got her ready for her funeral, the doctors went, oh my God, it's a woman who's had a child on top of it. Um, and she's buried in a place called Watsonville, California, in the Odd Fellow Cemetery. And what I did was I took all the facts and then I novelized the part we don't know about her. So it's a, I called on the book a novel inspired by a true story. Um, oh. And so now it's a screenplay. I was going to well, say, it sounds like it, I, it the make book, a great movie. The book is doing very well on Amazon. We just hit over 500 reviews already, um, which is a lot for somebody who's not, you know. The Whip. The whip. Spell whips. W-H-I-P. And whips were stagecoach drivers. That's right. what a stagecoach driver So that's for the title. Called. I didn't realize yeah, that. the whip. Yeah. I've had people say to me, whoa, what's that <laughs> book about? Anyway, um, and it's now a screenplay that I adapted with a partner. And it's in some really good hands. I don't know what's going to happen because we know Hollywood. Um, right. But uh, some people are very interested in it. We'll see. Um, Maybe as a movie, maybe as a like an HBO three-parter movie of the week kind of thing, you know. Um, she she took people on her stagecoach. You know, it, it it was the adolescence of America when she was a stagecoach yeah. driver. I mean, America was growing, and the Civil War was happening, and the South and and East, and um, you know, it was a great time, and so. It's a period of time that's the that movies. It's, it's a great time, but it's a very hard time. Yes, very hard. But you know, women. This book deals with how women were treated. You had you women out there watching this. Women had uh, three choices: you could be a wife, a prostitute, and if you were a little wealthy, your family and they could teach you to read. You got to read, then you could be a teacher. That was it. No, no other choices. Men got to run all around the countryside and be gold miners, and, and they got yeah. to be bank. They got to be everything. It is amazing how far women have come in, in such a short period of I know, time. I know, it's true. I mean, it's only just a little over a century. Yes, it's 150 years, you know. Yeah. Um, well, not even. I mean, if you say mid-1800s, then it, well, what Well, when that? the women That's, got the yeah. vote. Yes, which took forever. Yeah. I mean, women were property. Uh, and then, now we're still dealing with, unfortunately, 
we can't even, the Civil War is not over in some states still. You know, I don't oh, know what this yeah. is. They, they keep on and on. Anyway, I don't want to get into that, but. <sighs> on that note, my lovely, All right, I'm just promise gonna, on I'm tape just, that I'm, you'll have me back. Yeah, uh, uh, yes, and I just want to say, um, um, I'm wishing all the people out there health and magic always. Would you like to get it, dedicate the show to anyone? Oh, yes, to, of course, who else? My mom and daddy, you know, my okay. mama Lillian and my wonderful stepfather, Varnum. Okay. They're gone. Thank but you. They're here now, you know.